Merci à tous, à tous les panélistes d'avoir accepté de d'avoir ce, cette discussion avec nous cet après-midi qui va durer environ une heure. Alors donc cette discussion va s'articuler autour de plusieurs thèmes, notamment les modèles d'enseignement innovants et également le rôle que peuvent jouer les enseignants, les gouvernements, les leaders d'industrie et la société civile afin de mettre en place un environnement d'apprentissage compétitif qui répond aux défis de nos pays. Ce matin, dans son discours d'ouverture, Son Excellence M. Alassane Ouattara a quand même rappelé des faits importants, notamment le fait que chaque année, nous avons à peu près 100 000 jeunes qui foulent le seuil des universités ici en Côte d'Ivoire et qui ont du mal à trouver justement des places dans ces universités. Malgré le fait que d'ici 2020-2025, on aura dix autres universités qui vont être construites ici, on est quand même confronté au problème euh, de, de, de place dans les universités. Donc il faut, évidemment, pour résoudre ce problème de capacité, réfléchir à des moyens innovants, justement pour dispenser des, des enseignements à ces étudiants, mais aussi trouver des mécanismes de formation qui pourront allier la formation et l'emploi afin que tous ces jeunes qui sont formés puissent trouver du travail à l'issue de leur formation. Donc c'est un peu tous ces thèmes que nous avons essayé de, de, de quand nous allons discuter cet après-midi avec nos, nos panélistes et nous allons tout de suite commencer nos discussions avec euh, Monsieur Kofi Nguessan qui est donc euh, le directeur de l'INPHB à qui je vais poser la première question. Monsieur Kofi, comme vous le savez, nos économies évoluent, le monde change, les entreprises ont de nouveaux besoins. Euh, au niveau de l'INPHB, on aimerait savoir cet après-midi comment vous vous assurez justement que l'enseignement qui est dispensé à vos étudiants est en, est en adéquation avec les besoins du marché qui évolue constamment. Merci donné l'occasion de parler de l'INPHP qui est en fait le consortium de 15 écoles qui forme au métier de l'agronomie, de l'industrie, du génie civil, du commerce, des mines. Et nous avons de nouveaux programmes en création notamment comme et au métier de l'aéronautique, comme data science expert, comme aussi à la métrologie. Donc, il y a aussi pas mal de projets en, en gestation. Et je dois dire que eh, la situation d'une grande école comme l'INPHP est relativement différente de celle des universités. Parce que eh, pour rester collé au marché de l'emploi, accroître nos taux d'employabilité, nous avons entrepris depuis quelques années des réformes relativement courageuses de nos programmes. Mais la réforme que nous menons aujourd'hui est en synergie avec les entreprises. C'est-à-dire que lorsque nous sommes en train, nous organisons les réunions, on contacte les entreprises, on discute avec elles et on sait à peu près ce dont elles, le profil d'ingénieur ou de technicien supérieur dont elles ont besoin dans quelques années et nous réadaptons, nous adaptons nos programmes dans ce sens. Donc ça c'est la première solution. La deuxième solution c'est, et une fois qu'on a ces programmes, c'est d'impliquer les experts des entreprises dans la formation des étudiants, de sorte que eux mêmes sachent la réalité et que les étudiants aient le profil souhaité le profil attendu au niveau de l'entreprise. Donc ça, c'est euh, la réforme classique que nous faisons. Mais à l'INPHB, on a d'autres types de programmes qui permettent de coller la formation à la réalité. On a des programmes, un programme avec les entreprises, et avant de déterminer le programme, nous avons créé ce qu'on appelle le comité d'orientation stratégique. C'est-à-dire que ce comité regroupe à la fois les entreprises des différents secteurs ciblés, nous discutons des besoins des entreprises et nous créons le programme en fonction de ce type de besoins. De sorte que, à la fin de la formation, les élèves ou les apprenants sont automatiquement recrutés par les entreprises. Mais un autre programme que nous avons mis en place à l'INP, c'est l'école de la deuxième chance. Quoi, c'est un concept nouveau que nous avons appelé pompeusement deuxième chance. C'est, nous sommes une école d'intérêt public, une école de service public. Que faisons-nous? pour résorber le stock de diplômés sans emploi. Vous savez, les universités forment à la connaissance générale. 
Elles ne font pas au métier. C'est pas le rôle de former au métier. C'est vrai, il y a la professionnalisation qui est en cours, mais au départ, les universités délivrent des connaissances académiques. Mais quand on a donné une maîtrise, qu'on a une MBTS ou qu'on a un doctorat qu'on ne peut pas trouver au travail, est-ce qu'une école professionnelle comme l'INP a des outils nouveaux pour donner une deuxième chance à un étudiant C'est-à-dire créer des programmes qui forment au métier. Et donc, l'école la deuxième chance est destinée à transformer un maîtrisant en quelqu'un qui va avoir une qualification nouvelle. Concrètement, est-ce que l'INPA a les capacités de transformer un titulaire d'une maîtrise d'histoire, de criminologie en informaticien ou en, en banquier ou en un emploi nouveau, par exemple C'est ça, cette réflexion, nous essayons de l'amener pour résorber progressivement le stock de diplômés sans emploi qui seront reconvertis en des métiers nouveaux porteurs sur le marché de l'emploi. Et puis, l'autre, la dernière expérience que nous avons, c'est justement sur ce panel, certaines personnes vont en parler, c'est avons-nous des outils pour former des, jeux, des, des étudiants à devenir eux-mêmes entrepreneurs. C'est extrêmement important parce que lorsque vous formez un ingénieur aux qualités d'entrepreneur, ce type, en créant son entreprise, il viendra chercher d'autres étudiants, des techniciens supérieurs qui vont l'aider à développer son entreprise. Donc, ce sont des réflexions dans ce sens que nous menons afin d'aider les services publics, afin d'aider le gouvernement, afin d'aider les entreprises à mieux comprendre le marché du travail et à nous aider aussi à définir les programmes de sorte que eh, l'école ne forme pas pour le chômage, mais que l'école forme pour l'emploi, l'auto-emploi. Je dois reconnaître que dans certaines filières, mes collaborateurs sont là, dans certaines filières, la demande, l'offre d'emploi dépasse même le nombre de diplômés que nous mettons sur le marché. Parce que nous avons pris la précaution de définir nos programmes en cohérence et en synergie avec les entreprises. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kofi. I think that the idea of the school of the second chance is clearly an idea that will uh, continue to resonate because um, I found it, uh, you know, extremely original, you know, the fact that you can recycle, uh, you know, young graduate. Uh, you mentioned in the end of your presentation that you are trying to train as much as possible a student to become entrepreneurs. So I think that, you know, this is something that will resonate in uh, Mrs. Galdon's uh, mind because she's teacher of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation at uh, IE University and uh, this is especially this is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis teaching you know how to become an entrepreneur so I, I want you to you know tell us exactly uh, what you teach and what are the tools that you give to the students but also talk about the concept of uh, social innovation because you are promoting social inno innovation in your um, you know, curriculum, so I want to know more about that and uh, how, you know, this concept of social innovation can transform education in Africa and better prepare um, our students for challenges of tomorrow. Thank you very much. So, um, social innovation is a fascinating concept. Uh, and I'm 100% biased, by the way, because this is my own topic of research, but in my opinion it is. And it's fascinating because uh, it is intrinsically a paradox, that's what it is. Social innovation is about innovating in a way that accrues value, not mostly for the person that innovates, but mostly for society. And it's a paradox because anyone who has tried and, been, and who has been involved in innovation efforts might be wondering why on earth would you do that? Innovating is expensive, in time, in effort, in frustration, and then also in money. Why would you do that? But really all morning we've been talking about paradoxes. This morning Mr. Uh, Minister opened by um, thanking the African American Institute and I quote for their consistency in their commitment to education in Africa. And yet this um, conference is labeled shifting paradigms. How can you be consistent in a context in which paradigms are permanently shifting. Then later, 
um, His Excellency the President was talking about moving to industrial production in a permanently changing environment and then he was talking about building universities and moving to online because there's not enough space and who, how do we make ends meet and this is all a paradox. And shifting to industrial production really again involves a paradigm which we have been really discussing all day which is in terms of the content of our training. Do we uh, use our students' time in changing their mindsets? Do we build a person? Or do we use our students' time in teaching them skills? Do we produce workers? And do we need to choose? I believe social innovation allows us to embrace the paradox. Paradox theory proves that any company, any person who pr is presented with a paradox, if they decide to choose between one avenue or the other, will move forward faster. But if they reject to choose, and although they know it's impossible, they decide to go after both, in the, in the long run, they're better, they perform better, right? So I believe that social innovation allows us to do this as a learning tool. When we imprint social innovation content in our programs, we build a person while we teach the skills. So to give you a few examples, in our master, in our international MBA program, our students, as, as a capstone project, they can consult for a small vulnerable merchants, owners of a small businesses, young artisans. They can consult for NGOs. And they can also consult for big firms. And so many teams every year, they choose to do that that has a social impact. We are building their empathy. We're building the, the human in them, right? While they are being trained in business administration at a very high level. We do the same in our masters for customer experience and innovation. The second term of that program entirely revolves around the social innovation program. All of the courses revolve around social innovation as a, as a project. Also in our master in visual and digital media, we have a project uh, in their online marketing course where they, where they have social impact. And you might have noticed none of the programs I mentioned are called social whatever, whatever. And our students are not paying us so that they can then become social workers. But in doing good, they do well. We can create powerful learning experiences for them. And this is a big part of what we do. The other big part of what we do is innovate also in the way in which we convey these learning experiences in finding a, a, what I find a, a, to be a very interesting combination of online and face-to-face, -face, which is again yet another paradox we've been talking about today. I reject the paradigm in which online training is second best to face-to-face -to -face because that is not our experience. Our experience is that online and specifically blended, we call blended uh, programs those which have very contained face-to-face um, -face period, so it's just like one week face-to-face -face and then three months online, and then one week face-to-face -face and then three months online. So this is proven to be very, very effective, where you bring together the empathy component, the human component, and the best of technology. And that is very best, absolutely optimal in many circumstances. And actually, our students from Africa have found this very appealing, and 23% of our students in blended programs come from Africa. This seems to match very well the context in which they are. It seems to match very well their lifestyle, the sort of vision that they have for the development of these stages in their careers. It seems to match their wants way better than the idea of moving to Madrid for a year. And, so, and also in terms of managing our own infrastructure, and we were talking about infrastructure today a lot, right? Uh, you don't need as much, uh, as many square meters, right? If you only need people to be face to face for a week. And then you can just take turns, right? One, what program is here for a week when? And the rest be online and you can have the best of both worlds. And again, it's not, it's not easy, but Africa has a reputation for doing things that are not easy. If anybody in the world can, you know, if, if it can happen anywhere, it should happen here. You guys, I mean, I've when I, I did my master's in um, Harvard Kennedy School and my favorite professor, Calesto Juma, uh, he gave us example after example of technological leapfrogging 
in Africa and I became in love with the idea of technology and social innovation, which is my main topic of research, by learning from Calestos. So there, I, I do see this opportunity where the rest of the world has learned from Africa to leapfrog and now the opportunity for Africa to continue to leapfrog and just jump directly into what makes sense. And I do believe from experience that you can be a world leader in high, the highest quality higher education institution in the world teaching online with social innovation content because that's, that's what we do. Thank you, thank you, Conception, for you know sharing with us your experience and also giving tools in terms of innovative way of uh, teaching. Will the ultimate aim at producing workers? I think that you know you two have this in common: producing workers, people that can you know be meeting the demand of the market. So I will be turning now to Mrs. Fanny, who is you know, on the ground, helping SMEs, uh, you know, growing by providing them funding. And uh, being on the ground, do you see this shift, you know, in uh, the way uh, the workforce and the students are trained so that they can be readily, I would say, ready, I would say ready, to, you know, address the challenges of your SMEs and uh, what are the main challenges that they are facing when it comes to recruiting and having the right person working in those companies. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. It's a very inspiring discussion. Um, let me start by a question uh, to the audience, if I may. Um, how many of you have looked for, uh, let's say, a good person to fix the plumbing at home? A good plumber? Good. Were you successful? Were you satisfied? You don't live in Abidjan, do you? Okay, that's why you were happy. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it's a simple question, but I think it really exemplifies uh, one of the aspects that I see in my work every day, I try uh, to identify promising SMEs um, that need funding. Uh, I look at their business fundamentals, uh, try to decipher whether they're in a growing market, uh, whether they have a, a good technology or a good product. But I find myself more and more asking the question, do they really have the human resources to carry on their development plan? And very often the answer to this question is no. No, because there is a very important gap in terms of what these SMEs need. Um, they need craftsmanship, they need skilled workers. Um, I think it was Concepcion who mentioned that this morning, uh, unfortunately I missed the, the address, but this morning we talked about Cote d'Ivoire wanting to become uh, industrialized. We produce a lot of um, uh, raw um, uh, producer, cocoa, etc., and we want to process more. But if you look at an SME today trying to get into this sector, they will face a very important challenge finding the people who can work in an industry, who can process the cocoa, because the training is just not there. When I speak to SMEs trying to recruit uh, this type of employees, it's, it seems like it's, a, it's a, almost a mountain for them to climb to really find, and the most courageous one really taking on themselves to train and go elsewhere and bring back this knowledge here. So when I look at really the shift in the demand, whether there is a change, I can say we can definitely do better and more, especially for SMEs. Uh, of course, big multinationals have all sorts of means to hire the qualified people, and um, most of the time they bring people from outside back here. Um, but to me, really the significant part of the effort has to be on uh, building a system that can really produce the type of skilled workers that small companies need. And we don't necessarily need to invent something new. If you look at countries like Switzerland, for example, or Germany, 
This is something they have been doing for many years and they're very successful. If you look at Switzerland in particular, about 69% of the youth between 15 and 20 actually choose apprenticeship. So they go to school, they work in a company, and the companies themselves participate in defining what type of courses they need to take. And at the end of this system, they're making 22% more than their peers who didn't really go through this. And if you look at Switzerland again, I think the employer rate is close to 2%. So definitely they're doing something that works. I think we have um, a huge potential here to try and replicate such systems and really build the skills we need for SMEs first and then go up the ladder and keep building engineers like Mr. Nge Sandu. We also need them, but we should not forget really the base uh, for SMEs, especially having qualified skilled workers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your contribution. So there is still a gap that needs to be addressed for, for the SMEs and uh, more uh, best practices sharing should be done and the example of Switzerland is great and uh, it's something that could be replicable in our countries. So definitely uh, a takeaway from your contribution. Thank you. Um, I, I will turn now to Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel is uh, an alumni of uh, AAI. So he has been granted uh, a scholarship back in 2016, went to the US uh, to get a degree in math, uh, got back to Uganda where he's a teacher. So I wanted to have your perspective in terms of um, you know, the key learning of this experience in the US and how this has transformed the way you give your teaching now to, to your students and uh, how you, know, you have evolved as a teacher after this experience in the, in the US. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Emmanuel, I come from Uganda and I'm a high school teacher. Uh, after having taught for eight years, I was privileged by AI. I was privileged to be selected by AI for a scholarship by East African Development Bank to do a master's in mathematics education. Uh, I call it a unique opportunity because most of the funding that are in Uganda only focus at university level. Few people are focusing at high school teachers. But I thank AI for having considered high school teachers. I know there's a lot we are benefiting. Uh, when I went to Ratigas, my experience was interesting because we are in the first cohort. Uh, so reaching at Ratigas, I was studying mathematics education. And one of the things that was shocking to me was telling me that I'm supposed to take an online class, which was a technology class. It was shocking to me, but I thank AI that supported us and Ratigas University. And it became one of the most important things that I got interested in. While I was looking at mathematics education, I saw a gap between our curriculum and that of USA in terms of the way they teach mathematics to students. Uh, two things that came to my mind, or the gaps that I realized. In Uganda, we are teaching procedure. We just give students formulas. But they, there is no conceptual understanding. Another thing was the use of technology. And because of the demands that we are having nowadays, I think there is even one speaker who mentioned that our curriculums are outdated. Because we are using chalk and talk. The way I was trained as a teacher, I got a chance this year, part-time at one of the universities, 
teaching teachers how to teach mathematics. I was teaching them the same methods. Or the curriculum, I mean, the, the syllabus they gave me was to teach them the way I was taught. So when I was in Rutgers, I got an idea of sharing my experience with my teachers because I saw there is a need to change the way we are teaching our students. We need them to understand this mathematics. So I think we need to integrate technology in our teaching to explain some of the concepts. And when you look at technology, there is a lot of open resources that we can use as teachers. But because of the fear to use technology, most of the teachers in Uganda, and maybe in other countries, we are not utilizing those resources. Uh, take an example, Khan Academy. When I went back, I started using some of those things. Of course, there are challenges, like uh, the internet is not so fast, we don't have computers, but I think it is the way that is important. Uh, one of the things that I do, I just buy bundle on my phone. Then I connect to my computer. You may find I have only one laptop, but I'm using that one to show my students. But you see that the attitude really has changed, and they love your subject. I may not conclude that it is, I, not, I can not conclude in terms of results, but at least the attitude, you see that the students are enjoying the class. Some concepts seem complex to explain, but if you use some of these videos, they, are real, they can bring out the idea to you, the teacher, and even the students. So I think the way to go is to integrate technology, and teachers should embrace the technology. But it should start from the training, the way our universities are training us. They should at least change, at least match the demands of our nation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Emmanuel. Great, uh, great example. Great example. Thank you. Uh, now I will turn to, to Bian. You've listened to <laughs> all the contribution of the, the panelists. Just wanted to get your perspective and your views on what was discussed in terms of, uh, you know, the role that the government, the civil society, and also industry leaders uh, could play to make sure that, you know, we train more, we train better, and also we train at you know reasonable cost for the communities. So, could you give us your perspective on that? Sure. Sure. Um, I, I think the I mean technology is going to help us without doubt. We have the benefit of having tools today to provide mass reach of information, knowledge. You know, um, technology helps to do that. Um, and we're already taking advantage of that. Uh, I, I think in the initiatives that most of us have been involved in, in education, you do realize that um, technology helps you to reach more people more quickly, with more consistent quality, uh, more effectively, more efficiently. There's no question. And Africa's access to technology is, is, is growing very fast. But I think before we start fully taking advantage of that, we need to take a step back. Um, there's no question in any of our minds that for us to accelerate the pace of development, to close the gap we have with other continents, we have to have a slightly different approach. That approach starts by us being, I think, very, very clear about what are the true priorities for us to develop our countries. Should we have a more succinct de debate about whether we need, you know, more people with general skills from universities, or we need more specialists, technicians, artisans? Um, those debates should be had, and then by country we decide what are the short-term priorities and long-term priorities. So number one is always being clear around what are the priorities. And this is important across all of the stakeholders. Government cannot do it on their own. Government needs private sector, civil society, they need you know, NGO partners, 
all of these people have to come together and agree what is it that we're going to do first. And I think it sounds very obvious, but if you look around, we all have very different priorities in this room. The debates that we have in here, the discussions we're having, the academics have different priorities, and they're not necessarily aligned with what the private sector needs. The private sector has different urgencies, and they're not in concert with what the countries need sometimes. So there has to be a more frank dialogue about what are the true priorities the countries need to accelerate their development and close the gap they have. And then secondly, the most logical thing is that when you get this, we, we experience that even in the projects that we run in Cote d'Ivoire, trying to transform the livelihoods in rural communities, in the cocoa growing areas. You, you have projects that are creating an ecosystem that involves multiple stakeholders. Anytime you have stakeholders with different priorities, different um, ideas, different thoughts about how to achieve things, it's very difficult to synchronize their work and coordinate their work. So one of the challenges you face is just somebody has to make sure that we're all on the same page and we're headed towards the same objective, we speak in the same language, we know how to measure what we're trying to do, and we know how to share the learnings. It sounds obvious, but actually for most development work, when you start going across multiple stakeholders, that is not trivial work. Somebody has to consciously take the time to guide, coordinate, and ensure that you can communicate across these multiple stakeholders with different, with different urgencies. That's the second element. And by the way, coordination work, so far as education is concerned, there's no other way it has to be done by the government. The government is the only credible um, and responsible stakeholder that has the resources and the authority to be able to coordinate. But they have to work with the other, more, uh, with the other stakeholders. That's very clear. The other thing that we forget sometimes in trying to make, if we're going to scale up these ideas, we have to go much faster than we do right now. We're still very slow. We still spend so much time trying things, piloting, um, trying to tweak designs. And I just feel in the private sector, the approach for most of us in companies was, if something works somewhere else in an emerging market, we copy, we paste it here, we tweak it as we go. Nobody's talking about piloting or trialing. You just do it. And you're going to figure out if you have to adjust it or not. 75% of the time, you don't have to adjust it. It still works. But if you step back and try to intellectualize it and see why Africa is different from Latin America, you'll spend two years trying to redesign something you don't need to redesign. Copy, paste, get going, tweak as you find the need to tweak it. We need to move much, much faster. We don't have the time. The, the next thing and the final thing I want to talk about is the fact that we, you know, when you do stuff, you do projects across with multiple stakeholders. Again, the idea of being very clear about who is doing what, who is accountable for what, when they have to deliver their results, and how we're going to make sure that we achieve what we're trying to achieve seems trivial. But very often in these projects. It's one of the areas where we drop the ball. And we cannot move fast, we cannot accelerate if that lack of synchronization is there. Being very clear who has the ball when and when they hand it over to the next person and who is doing stuff in power. And I think I've seen over the last 15 years looking at these projects across, and by the way, you know, very often in the private sector we're tempted to just say, well, look, government is slow, um, the NGOs are disorganized, we we'll just do it ourselves. Then we realize, well, actually, we don't know how to do it. We need, we need help. Um, and you realize that you, it may slow you down a little bit. But really, you go much further and you have a much more sustainable project when you involve the other stakeholders. It complicates your life because you have to align with their thinking. You have to negotiate, agree on priorities. But trust me, the time you lose, you make up by going so much further than having the chance to get so much more skill. It's impossible to scale up anything in education in the country if the government is not on board. There is no way the private sector on its own, no matter how efficient, can scale up transformational educational programs in Africa. You have to have the government on, on side. And there's no way the government on its own can meet all of the needs that we have on this continent. They need the private sector. We, the government and the private sector, do not have the skills to implement at the local level 
every, all the time. You need civil society, NGO partners, who have, who have the reach, who have the proximity to these co co uh, communities. So the reality is that we have to collaborate. It has to be better organized, better synchronized, clearly prioritized, with accountability is very, very clear. And this is the way we can make sure that we stop losing time. We stop being efficient in how we spend the funds that we have. We stop being ineffective in how we deploy resources. We have to be much more disciplined in how we execute the things that we have to execute. Thank you. Th thank you, Bill. Um, from, from your intervention, it's clear that we all have a role to play, but that the government really has to drive the uh, education agenda and make sh thing, uh, sure that things happen much more faster than they, they do today. So, so thank you to all for your contribution. So we will now um, hand it over to the room and uh, ask questions to the students first and then to uh, anyone who has, a, who has a question. So we have about 25 minutes or so for, for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gulam Mohamed Bai from Mauritius. And I think the way University of Mauritius was set up originally could provide a very good example of what could be happening in Africa in future years to come. When Mauritius was about to become independent in the 60s, small country, small population, barely 700,000 people, big question of whether we should set up a university or not. An international panel was set up. It was a British uh, colony mostly British, and they advise, yes, do set up a university, but make it a developmental university. And ensure that whatever you teach, whatever you do, is directly related to the development of Mauritius, so that you don't get any unemployment. And that's the formula that was used and which worked. We already had a college of agriculture, essentially training technicians for the sugar industry, which was the backbone for, for the economy of Mauritius at that time. It's disappeared now. And that became the first part of the university. Then industrialization. We produced technicians essentially to assist the industry. At, in different phases, we started with electronics industry. Then we moved on to textile industry. And so on and so on. Everything the university did from late 1960s to up to 1980, it was purely and only developmental. We never run degrees. We run technician courses because that's what industry wants. We always worked with industry. Government supported us because all the funding came from government, but it really worked. And I mention this because I heard again and again, so many new universities are being set up in different regions of Africa, new universities. In Cote d'Ivoire, you've got about five or six more universities coming up in different regions. Perhaps for political reasons, I don't know. But I think when a new university is set, being set up in, in, in Africa, it should use the developmental university model. Make sure that it responds directly and immediately to the needs of the community, of the region, and gradually mushroom into a full-fledged university. Now, University of Mauritius is a full-fledged university, but it started as a developmental university. I think it's a concept that perhaps one could consider because it worked for Mauritius. It really worked in uh, helping the development of Mauritius, and maybe it could help some countries in continental Africa as well. It's a question about pedagogy. So you were talking about embracing curriculum um, technology. And I, I hesitate whenever I hear you know, the idea that innovation in pedagogy always has to be equated to adopting some kind of technology in, in, in uh, schools. I think the question should be for us, how can we teach in a creative way that enables students to be engaged and to improve you know, performance. Um, and then the last thing that I would say in relation to that is, there's a lot of talk about how the curriculum is restrictive because the authority to change the curriculum lies in the hands of regulatory institutions. My question is, can pedagogy be the go around to get students to imbibe the kinds of soft skills that we want them to have, whether it's critical thinking or problem solving, in a way that doesn't, that the work, the scheme of work doesn't restrict a teacher. So take, for example, you know, the earlier suggestion, are you able to have 
take-home assignments that allow students to play around with the concepts that they learn in class, you know, such that you are not necessarily changing the content of the scheme of work, but you're in a, in a way allowing, helping your students to kind of think a bit more critically about real-world application of the things that they learn. So something around pedagogy as both thinking more kind of critically about what we can introduce to improve outcomes, but also as a way to navigate the challenges around changing the content of the curriculum. Emmanuel, you want to comment on that? Yes, thank you. I think one, apart from uh, the curriculum, also the form of assessment that we are having is also affecting us. I'm in a, a school where the principal wants results. And we have a national exam. And of course, I must teach towards achieving results. Irrespective of whether the students have understood, I must give content such that the students are able to answer the questions. So I think it's a, another thing that is hindering us. The form, as, the form of assessments that we are having in our country. Um, the, the gentleman raised a, a point on creative way of teaching. So I know Conception that uh, at IE University uh, you are, I would say, promoting a collaborative way of teaching. So could you please comment on that to address this, uh, this point, please? Well, we, um, we look a lot into the um, appropriate role of technology and I think it's a very valid point that you made. Much of uh, our work around reinventing the learning experience uh, is not on technology. Um, some of what we do, or a lot of what we do, has to do with technology, but much does not. Much has to do with new approaches, new pedagogical approaches. Um, some of them are very renowned. We didn't invent, like flip the, flip the classroom, right? Rather than have the students come in, uh, you talk at them, uh, and then they leave, do homework. How about you make the information available to them before class, they do homework, not at home, but in class, with the professor there to help them so they play around with the concepts with you in the room. Uh, in, it's a facilitated learning environment rather than you talking at them. And then later, they can continue to work at home after having had this facilitated experience with you. We've also heavily embraced human-centered design approaches, uh, so co-creation, um, also project-based uh, project uh, learning, um, teamwork approaches, uh, where they also learn soft skills at the same time as they're learning the, the specific, more technical skills that uh, we're hoping they will learn. And, uh, and a big part, like inter, uh, interactive exercises on the spot. So we use a lot of demos. We use a lot of, um, we use a lot of, uh, and uh, there's technology um, for this, um, like synchronous exercises. Like for example, in my own classroom, I would give them a, a real-time surveys right there and then, right? I, I launch a, a question, I have prepared a survey, I have a, just a bit of code, it's like zero euros, zero euros. I go on SurveyMonkey, prepare my survey beforehand, I throw out a question, give them a BD code so that they can on the spot go online, answer my survey, give them 30 seconds, boom, I have the results, the, uh, it's anonymous and we can discuss, you know, who said this, who said that, why this percentage of you things like this, things like that has this sort of a background. So there really is a lot of things that cost zero uh, that, uh, that can be done. Thank you, Conception. I think there is this gentleman and after lady. Sir? Please, sir, yes. Alors, nous avons une caractéristique en Afrique qui est que on a le taux d'analphabétisation et du taux d'analphabète qui est assez élevé. Et nous parlons là de développement de compétences. Au-delà des efforts qui sont faits dans nos universités, il faut y prendre en compte cette marge de la population qui se trouve dans le secteur tertiaire et qui contribue fortement au développement du PIB dans nos nations aujourd'hui. Alors, quel regard de projet ou de formation ou encore de développement de compétences on peut avoir à l'égard de ces personnes qui puissent véritablement permettre de donner un essor véritable donc, dans leurs activités Parce que quoi qu'on qu dise, 
effectivement, ils représentent une grande partie de la population et ils ont besoin de compétences réelles pour que, effectivement, leurs efforts puissent compter dans la balance de l'économie. Merci. Oui, je crois que c'est une excellente question. Le président de la République l'a dit ce matin. Hein. Il y a à peu près 20 à 30 de la population qui, qui n'a pas été à l'école. Mais ces personnes contribuent énormément à, à la croissance économique, souvent au niveau de l'agriculture. Donc, que faisons-nous Je crois que c'est une excellente question. Je crois que il y a des débuts de solution. Vous savez, ces personnes sont à un certain âge aujourd'hui. Dit qu'on va recommencer par faire leur formation à la base, c'est une très grande perte de temps et ces personnes ne l'accepteront pas. Mais l'idée, c'est pour nous trouver des mécanismes nouveaux pour les amener à comprendre au moins comment le monde évolue, comment le monde fonctionne. Je crois que nous avons dans nos équipes ce que nous appelons « former tout au long de la vie ». C'est-à-dire que les amener eux-mêmes à s'intéresser à la formation, à comprendre leur centre d'intérêt et venir vers le centre de formation pour qu'on propose des programmes adaptés à ces gens. Je crois que c'est l'une des questions. Il y a d'autres solutions, mais c'est l'une des questions des de solutions. C'est-à-dire les amener, amener ces personnes elles-mêmes à comprendre leur handicap, à comprendre aujourd'hui les nouveaux outils. Parce que si vous prenez aujourd'hui le milieu agricole, il y a pas mal euh, de de solutions au niveau même de la météorologie qui se passe sur les, le téléphone mobile. Est-ce que eh, comment un agriculteur peut lire le temps Comment peut-il savoir qu'il faut planter maintenant ou faut planter après parce que la saison n'est plus Donc c'est d'autres nouveaux outils qu'il faut leur proposer pour que ces personnes ne soient pas en dehors hein, de l'évolution mondiale. Mais ça demande beaucoup d'efforts. Madame Fanny uh, wanted to comment on, on this question. Merci pour cette question. Je pense que ça, ça recadre un peu, un peu les choses. Il y a des besoins qui sont vraiment très variés. Euh, quand vous parlez de personnes analphabètes, je reviendrai encore un peu sur euh, l'idée qu'on peut former en apprenant en même temps. Donc aujourd'hui, il y a un certain nombre de métiers pour lesquels on n'a pas besoin d'avoir un bac plus 5, d'avoir un doctorat. C'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, on pratique déjà plus ou moins, euh, les, on connaît tous les apprentis, donc on voit les apprentis dans différents métiers, mais je pense que la façon dont c'est approché aujourd'hui ne permet pas à ces personnes-là de sortir de l'informel. D'où l'idée d'allier l'apprentissage à au moins un minimum de formation. C'est-à-dire, au lieu d'avoir un apprenti qui, pendant euh, 3-4 ans, est avec euh, un mécanicien ou un menuisier, et qui ne fait en fait que répéter des gestes, il a parallèlement à ce passage avec euh, un maître euh, d'apprentissage une formation de base pour laquelle, grâce à laquelle il pourra structurer un projet. Et M. Nguesson a parlé d'entrepreneuriat euh, tout à l'heure. Je pense que tout ça c'est lié. Parce que quand vous regardez des pays euh, européens qui ont réussi vraiment à bâtir sur ce modèle d'apprentissage, les personnes qui sont des chefs d'entreprise chez eux ne sont pas des personnes qui ont un doctorat ou qui ont fait 10 ans d'études. Ce sont des personnes qui, dès 15 ans, ont commencé à se former à un métier. Et euh, à 25 ans, ils ont 10 ans de métier et ils ont appris des choses basiques en termes de gestion qui leur permettent de créer des entreprises, de créer des emplois et derrière même d'embaucher des ingénieurs, des docteurs après, etc. Donc pour moi, je pense que le passage vraiment pour nous est important et euh, il y a toute une éducation également à faire au niveau euh, collectif pour comprendre que ces métiers-là, en fait, sont des métiers d'avenir qui ne sont pas dévalorisants, mais que c'est un passage qui peut permettre justement à une population qui n'est pas forcément très lettrée de pouvoir acquérir des compétences et de créer des activités qui seront pérennes. Bill, she said it all. <laughs> okay. I was, I was just going to add one other thing. You know, part of the challenge is that we look at agriculture. This debate has been going on in the industry for a while. Why are young people not interested in agriculture? These professions um, have to have a different value to society for them to attract the youth. They have to contribute differently. And I think that can happen. In agriculture, for example, uh, It's one of those areas where we have all of the fundamentals to be able to leverage that to create much more employment. 
we have to ask ourselves why that's not happening. There's a skills discussion. But I believe even in a country like Cote d'Ivoire or in Ghana, when you look at the value chain for the cocoa industry, when you look at the portion of the value chain that goes to farmers, you have generations who have seen their parents work as hard as anybody can work, creating very little value for themselves, but creating a lot of value for a lot of people in the value chain. Unless we can confront the inequity in how the value is distributed along the value chain, you will not attract youth to those careers. And our countries are in a unique position to be able, especially in the cocoa industry, to have that dialogue with industry and to force a redistribution of the value created, to attract young people who do not need a high degree of skills, who we have already the institutions, the technicians, the outreach officers, to be able to convert them into meaningful participants in agriculture. But they're not interested because the value is elsewhere. And the same applies in South Africa. I remember a couple of years ago, in South Africa, we were struggling to find artisans to run our production lines, artisans. But we had a lot of engineers. For generations, we convince our kids that they have to be engineers to be valued. Oversupply of engineers, undersupply of artisans. And the schools cannot react fast enough. So what happens? The market then adjusts the salaries for artisans because everybody's scrambling for them. The salaries of artisans are bumped up because nobody can find them. What happens? All of the young engineers we had sitting in the offices, playing on computers, saying they're designing stuff, realized that artisans were making more than they were doing. They went to the decision shops, retrained themselves as artisans, and they were working on the production lines. Normally, if you value, the, if you let the market work and you value these, these vocational skills appropriately, the labor market will try to adjust itself. And we should do everything we can do to facilitate that adjustment to happen. And that's what we need to do in many of these areas that don't require a high level of skills in Africa. We, sometimes in most of our countries, we have the levers to be able to do that. We have to activate them, activate them aggressively, and be confident that we can do things differently than have been done in the past. Thank you. The, the debate is really <laughs> fascinating. But we have time for just one or two questions. Let's say two questions before we can wrap up. There is one gentleman here. He raised his hand a long time ago, please. <laughs> uh, my name is Adetun Jardinero. I have um, a little question for um, Mr. Ebe. Um, uh, we met in Dakar, and I told him a little bit about some of um, the projects that we do. Um, my question is, I, I know um, you mentioned the share and the apply you know, um, 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 method that we can take up what works somewhere else and then we can reapply in Africa. I, I know that works because when I was in PNG, this was some of um, the method that we were using and it was working perfectly. But my challenge is some of the um, ideas that have been shared in terms of the robotics engineering in Mali, the social innovations programs, the online programs, Currently today, our internet penetration in Africa is about 23%. How do we manage infrastructure with some of these ideas you know, that we want to reapply really from, from places where they have worked? Thank you. I think it's actually quite straightforward. And I think most of the African countries are trying to close that gap. We do realize that uh, for us to have the enabling environment for technology to enable us to leapfrog in certain industries, we need to have the enabling environment. Some of that has to do with infrastructure. And there's a big push now to ensure that look, there is no way we can accelerate our development on the continent if the basics are not there. Some of the basics are, of course, education, which is why we're here. You've got to get that right. Because that gives you the building blocks for you to be able to accelerate socioeconomic development to increase your ability to grow value in, the, in, in, in your societies, and also to be able to pull people out of poverty. You need that. People need to have security. There is no way you can have good education when there's insecurity. These are fundamental building blocks. They need to have health. They need to have the basic infrastructure. We can, we can train people all we want around entrepreneurship. If people cannot move their goods easily across the continent, we're not going to get anywhere. There will not be enough inter-African trade. 
if people cannot communicate easily, we're not going to be able to do transactions to export products abroad. Forget next door, talking about going intercontinental. If people cannot have good infrastructure around internet, if the educational infrastructure to deploy lessons, isn't it? We don't need the classrooms all the time, but we need the backbone to deploy, use technology to deploy lessons. In Cote d'Ivoire today and across West Africa, there are a lot of startups in EdTech that are trying to come up with creative ways to get teaching out to the rural areas. We're not going to close the gap in training people in rural areas by building classrooms. Forget it. We need to build classrooms, but we're never going to close the, close the gap. We can reach these people by other means, but we need infrastructure. So that's why we made the, the point about prioritizing. We need to look at these things and say, well, look, there's one approach. We can try to build classrooms for everybody in all the rural areas. Then we can't get teachers to move out there. We're trying to get a teacher to move out to a campement, the cacao, in the middle of nowhere, they will not do it. So how do you reach those people? You need to use technology to deploy teaching to those people. What, what infrastructure do you need? Internet access, good telecom. That enables you to actually leapfrog. You don't have to build so many classrooms. So you're absolutely right. These elements, that's why we need to step back and say, for us to achieve what we're trying to achieve, to avoid going through this long learning curve, what are those high leverage things we need to do to enable us to take advantage of what is available elsewhere? to avoid going through that long path. And one of them is what you mentioned, get the right infrastructure in place. I know countries are focusing on that. There's a lot of focus on that. It's not easy. And I believe that with the help of the developed countries that we're getting right now, all these infrastructure projects that are going on in Africa, I think we'll get there. We shouldn't lose hope. It's coming bit by bit, but we'll get there. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Okay, so we're going to take a last question from, uh, there is a lady who, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do agree with the speaker who observed that uh, to realize these reforms, we need to move together with all the stakeholders. However, um, I do have a problem when it comes to making this work. And I don't know what lessons you might have to offer especially with regard to government and communities and um, donors. The donors' agenda will often be different. They'll not be excited about the most innovative, uh, impactful innovation. The government will slow you down, especially with regulations. Accreditation, for example, will take forever. Um, government policy says curriculum reform after five years. So what lessons might you offer to help us? Je crois que c'est une question importante. Et aujourd'hui, eh, on n'a plus le choix. Parce que eh, le politique et les académies doivent se mettre ensemble pour trouver une solution. Parce que aujourd'hui, eh, comme quelqu'un le disait, il n'y a de richesse que d'hommes. S'il n'y a pas de compétences, il n'y a pas eh, d'espèces, de, il n'y a pas de, de, de cadres qualifiés, il n'y a pas de développement non plus. S'il n'y a pas de recherche eh, appliquée, de recherche approfondie, il n'y a pas de progrès aussi au niveau du développement. Donc, on est dans une synergie entre la politique et la formation. Je pense qu'il y a des avancées positives. Parce qu'il y a quelques années, des institutions internationales ne finançaient pas tellement la recherche et la formation. Aujourd'hui, tout le monde voit le danger de ne plus financer l'éducation et la formation. Parce que ça va compromettre la paix. Et comme il faut nécessairement la paix pour qu'il y ait le développement, donc il faut nécessairement qu'il y ait une synergie d'action entre la politique et les académiciens pour que le développement soit accéléré. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Conception Am I, um, For whatever it's worth, right uh, From uh, I, we do collaborate with the government and private sector and NGOs and it is really interesting how they all feel like we are a natural counterpart with whom to have a conversation. In my experience, and again for what it's worth, because this is probably the most difficult thing to do, which you just raised, right? It is, it is the most difficult thing and it feels difficult because it is difficult. Because as human beings, we're built to be difficult <laughs> in these kinds of contexts. So, my experience is it is 
a little bit less impossible if you get momentum around very specific goals, right? Revamp education in Africa, in my view, is not a goal specific enough to gain momentum and have very different groups of people with different interests in mind align quickly behind it. But if you can target like very, very concrete, measurable targets. 70% uh, of the population in Cote d'Ivoire has access to the internet uh, by 2025, right? That's like one, very, maybe it will be 70%, maybe it will be 60%, but there's like one very specific goal that everybody, we are going to redesign the math curriculum uh, in the next three years. All right, so let's focus, let's, but choose something and to the extent that it can be something that can unlock systems effects, and that's why I was taking your example, which I think is brilliant. Um, if you can choose one thing that can unlock systems effects and facilitate other things going on around it and just choose one very specific concrete thing that everybody will agree that is good and that can't be against anybody's agenda really, you can get momentum around it. And again, I think the fact that we have all been sitting here for one full day speaks, speaks to the fact, right? On this note, um, I'm going to end the panel. As you can see, this panel wants some concrete action, wants a strong push from the government, and wants education that is tying with the needs. So this is very simple, but at the same time, it's a great uh, action plan for, for the years to come. So thank you for our great panelists. Thank you to the audience. It was a pleasure for me to be with you this afternoon. Thank you again.